Hey y'all, I'm James Wright. Welcome to my shop. Today we're making a challenge coin rack. Or is it a geo is it a maker coin? We're making a coin rack. Let's dive in. So here is my challenge coin maker coin collection. Um, I have a couple actual challenge coins from military friends. Um, and I have other racing coins, and these are all makers coins. Um, and then these are geocaching coins. And I thought, you know, it'd be kind of fun to make a display cabinet for it. Um, I've made one in the past that was for challenge coins with an American flag. But since this isn't just a military challenge coin rack, I want to do something a little bit different. So let's have some fun. Now, the first problem I have is all the challenge coins are slightly different thicknesses. Now, the actual challenge coins, uh, those are relatively similar. However, the maker coins come in whatever size the maker decides to make it. So I wanted to do a bunch of test pieces. So I found a scrap piece I could run some grooves in, and I made uh, two different groove sizes that I found that fit most of them. And so different shelves are going to have a different groove side. But I want to make sure I could get that, and I want to make sure that they actually st sat in the groove and stood upright. For the actual frame, the top, bottom, and sides, we're going to be dovetailing those together. And I don't know exactly what size this is. It's something around 18 inches by 18 inches, and I don't care what size it is. I'm just going to cut one of them about that long, and then I'm going to transfer that over to the other board, and that is how wide this is going to be. I don't care what measurement it is. I'm just going to go off of the, the reality of I want it to be about that long, and therefore it's about that long. And as long as you make the, to the two top and bottom pieces match and the two side pieces match, everything's good. And so I'm going to make one and transfer the mark to the other one and then shoot them down until they are precisely the same width or length. A width of the box, length of the board, you know what I'm talking about. We're going to start with the dovetails and I like to do pins first. Uh, I find it just be a little bit simpler and easier. And for the pins, I don't draw a line down at what angle. I just tilt the saw to about that angle and cut. I, I like that little bit of freehand in here. It just makes it a little bit easier and simpler and one less step. I'm using a Filipino mahogany for this, and it is a relatively soft wood. And one of the problems anytime you're working with a wood that is a little softer is you need your tools to be extra sharp. Um, if you're doing a lot of practice with pine, you'll notice that it crushes a lot. You need the chisels to be incredibly sharp to get a nice clean surface on there. Uh, this one particularly is a very, very dusty wood. It leaves a lot of um, dust no matter what you do. We're going to transfer the lines over to the pin board, and I like to rest something farther down the board just to keep them at the same length. Mark the tail onto the pin board, and then we can cut straight down. And just like that, as long as you stay on the right line, you get a nice clean cut. It's a very easy, simple method. But staying on the right side of the line is very important, and a lot of people don't, and that's where you're probably going to get a lot of your gaps. You'll also notice in this project, I do occasionally have a few gaps here and there, and I don't worry about them too much. As long as the joint is functional, I actually leave the gaps. I don't fill them and try and hide them. I like to show my mistakes rather than try and keep them hidden. I like to chop out most of the material, especially if I'm doing something small like this. If I'm doing something a little larger with a lot of them, I might come in and cope out the material and then chisel back to the line. But if I'm going to be chiseling it already, I might as well just chop them out. So six of it does of another. Um, I do find the coping tends to be a little bit faster on average, um, but I, I prefer the, the chopping. I find it to be more fun. For the four shelves, I'm going to make them ever so slightly smaller than the top and bottom piece, but I need to find out where the shoulders are. These are going to be tenoned into the two side pieces. So I'm actually going to use the piece that is the bottom and actually use the marks on that to transfer the shoulders onto these shelves. And that way I know that the shoulder distance from shoulder to shoulder is exactly the same as the inside distance to the dovetails. This way they will match perfectly. I don't care what that measurement is as long as they match the reality, that's what's important. With those marks on the end, I can then transfer all the way around and this will be the shoulder line for the tenon. I'm just making a fairly small tenon. It's not going to be holding a lot of weight. They're just these little light coins and I want to leave enough space so that it will uh, um, go into the wood a little ways. I don't need them to go all the way through. I was originally thinking I would do three through tenons. Um, I don't need that strength and it's actually a lot more work so why do that? I'm going to cut in about a sixteenth of an inch or so. Uh, once I decided to make a short one I thought well maybe I'll just have the, the full size of the board running into it and create dados. But I, I kind of like the, the cleaner look of the tenons. So I can chop in um, on the end down to whatever that shoulder line was. And then we're going to chop in about a sixteenth of an inch or so into the wood. Actually, I think it's about an eighth of an inch. Get a nice clean shoulder on there, maybe a little bit of undercutting. And then uh, we can move back on and figure out where we're going to put the mortises for these shelves to go in. 
using dividers is a quick, easy way to actually space out how many shelves do you need. And so I'm going to be going from the bottom of the top shelf or the top piece all the way down to the bottom of the board. And so it would be the bottom of the bottom shelf. So you're measuring bottom to bottom, in other words, center to center of the shelves. And so I can keep laying them out until I can get five marks top to bottom. And look at that. It comes out mm, perfect, right on. So now I know these are all spaced. And whatever those lines are, that is now the bottom of the shelf. So I can draw lines across the board. And I'm going to make sure I do it on both boards so that I get a smooth transition on the two sides so that I get the exact same measurement on both sides. And then I can come in and lay out the widths of the tenon uh, from the boards that I marked out. Just setting them on that line, I can mark either side of that tenon, and I can draw that across. The, the width of the tenon, I'm actually going to be doing with the marking gauge that I use to mark the tops of the, the tenons. Um, I've been saying tenon this whole time, haven't I? Oops, mortise, not tenon. Or more tenon, if I said mortise. You know what I meant. <laughs> For the chop down, we're going to have a little bit of fun here. And I, I really, really like this part. As long as you stay away from the lines. I don't touch the lines until I'm already down to depth all the way around. And it's really nice and clean. And then I can trim it down. Um, keeping it as, as, as far away from the lines as possible allows you to really sneak up on that tight fit. Uh, using the chisel bevel down to come in and remove most of the chips, um, I really, really enjoy this part. Uh, remember, chop down and then pair out. Uh, if you just try to pair out, you're going to be busting things out. And like that. Ooh, look, it fits in there. So that is how all of these shelves need to go in. So there's one. Now I just need to do seven more of them. For the grooves, I'm doing the top of the bottom as well as the top of all of the shelves. And this will be deep enough just to hold the coin so the coin will be able to stand up on its own. It's not leaning against anything. Uh, it's actually going to be in the groove and kind of um, propped into that. For the bottom two shelves, I'm making them a little bigger. And then for the top three, I'm making them a little bit smaller to fit most of them. After that, it's ready to start putting it together. For the glue up, I'm going to be using epoxy. Why epoxy? Because I, I actually it's my go-to wood glue now. Um, it's it's it is better than regular wood glue in almost all ways. Um, if I'm feeling really artsy fartsy, I'm going to do high glue. But I really like using simple epoxy. It works well. It has a lot of open time, so I can work on this all day long. Um, I can actually dial in how much working time I have on it, and that way I'm not rushing. And I've often found that if I'm rushing in the glue up, I make mistakes, I cause problems, and I really like just taking that pressure off, and the epoxy gives me that time to work with, so I don't have to rush at all, because it has about a, a two-hour open time for the, the hardener I'm using. After clamping it all up, taking it out, now we can smooth it out and do some of the detail work. If you skew the plane to 45 degrees, then you can go around the corner and you can actually go across the boards that way they're both running at 45 degrees and so you can see how you can kind of zigzag it around and always round the corner by hitting the corner at 45 degrees and so i'm bringing all these down to flush any little spots where one's a little higher than the other making them all feel good and if, once you get to the end of the stroke, you lift the plane out and you'll get a nice smooth transition. On the outsides with the epoxy, I'm going to smooth those all down, clean off any of the little bits of epoxy, and I really enjoy this step where um, things start to come to life. We're going to chamfer it all, and here I'm also going to be using the reed chamfer um, sled kit. Uh, this makes it really nice so that all my chamfers are exactly the same, and I'm bringing the chamfer down until it just touches the tip of that tail. Now for the uh, the two ends where I'm actually going to be going out the end grain, if you chamfer from one edge towards the middle and then lift it out and then turn it and chamfer from the other edge towards the middle with the chamfer plane, it allows them to meet in the middle and you get exactly the same chamfer all the way across. That way it's nice and clean and you're always planing into the wood rather than blowing out the corners of the, the wood sticking out. I'm going to use a little bit of sandpaper right off the bat, and this lets me know uh, where I have problems, and then I can come back through and actually scrape it. Um, and getting in and getting rid of all of the little glue squeeze out, the scraper works very well. Uh, if you have a really nice sharp knife, you can also use that to come in and, and detail out. I usually prefer to do the glue up before the finish uh, and just clean up the finish. Uh, any of the glue that's squeezing out there, I find that to work very, very well. Um, though some projects, I do like to do the glue up after finish. Each one's a little bit different. And look, the coins work. So let's actually put all these in here and make sure that everything works just before putting finish on here. Uh, I just want to make sure everything is the way it should be. And then, of course, how are we going to finish this? Boiled linseed oil and paste wax. Why? Because I like it. Um, it's just the finish I like. I don't like any amount of film finish on most things. I really don't like that look. I want to feel and see the wood. So having a raw 
wax oil finish with nothing built up, no poly, no shellac. Um, that's one of the reasons why I love Rubio Monocote, um, because it just has that, that raw wood feel. And uh, boiled linseed oil and paste wax really, really do that well. They're not a great protective finish. Uh, it is a very, very easy finish, and I, and I love the look, look of it. We're going to put a hanger on the back of this, though I haven't figured out exactly where I want to hang this right now. At the moment, it's actually sitting on my desk. Um, but at some point here, I'm going to find a good spot for it. And then I can put all the coins in there and start hanging it up. Now, I just need to fill it up. So, um, yeah, challenges to come. <laughs> I really had fun with this project, and I hope you do too. Lots of fun. So there you have it. Uh, really kind of simple. I've been wanting to do one of these for a while. Um, I did one not too long ago that had a flag with the coins for um, challenge coins, and I gave that to a friend of mine. But this one, uh, this one I wanted to make for myself because I have a whole bunch of maker coins. So these are coins that other makers have made and I've traded for. And if you have a maker coin you'd like to trade for, let me know. Um, but then I do have several challenge coins from military friends, and then I have geocaching coins. I want something to kind of display it all. So the only problem is I just need to find a place to hang this up. But uh, at least I've gotten this far. So I, I'm really liking how this came out. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. If you have any thoughts, comments, snide remarks, things I could have done better, please let me know. I do read through all of those and I answer as many of them as I can. Um, this is one of those simple, easy projects. There's not much to it, but I'm sure there's always things I could learn. So please let me know. But if you want to go even farther, there are a whole bunch of names over here. Those are some of the fantastic, wonderful, benevolent, gorgeous people over on Patreon. Because between patrons and members here on the channel, people who have clicked that thank you button, you guys support us. We are completely sponsored by you. We don't take in sponsors from outside. We make it so that I get to say what I want to say, uh, do what the community wants to do. And I, I really like to lean on the community and see what you guys want me to make. And a lot of times those are some of the projects that come out. So if you want to help out with that, think about becoming a patron or a member, clicking the thank you button. That means a lot. I think I'll do it for now. Until next time, have a wonderful day. Ah, challenge coins are very, very naughty things. That's why they're always on the rack.